So thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting me to give this talk on um, handcrafted futures. So um, my name is Aphrodite Psara, I'm a media artist from Athens, Greece. And the last um, five, six years I work with uh, electronic textiles and soft circuits. And um, my talk today is going to be a bit about my work, but also about um, the work of other artists that work in the field of e-textiles. And um, I named this uh, talk uh, Handcrafted Futures because I'm really interested and also I want to maybe start a discussion with you guys afterwards about uh, the potential of um, uh, electronic handicrafts and how they could be used in the future and how we could imagine like a more kind of humane future of technology and not something that is like uh, distracted from our very nature and the nature of tradition and all the things that we have um, actually um, have like in the um, field of um, um, handicrafts and craftsmanship until now. So I would like to start off by this book, Being Digital, of Nicolas Negroponte, which is a very interesting book for me because it's written in the 90s and uh, I don't know if uh, you all know who Nicolas Negroponte is. Uh, he was a director of the MIT Media Lab in the 90s and uh, he was a pioneering um, director, a pioneering um, 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 figure that really set the bar on how um, new technologies were going to be incorporated and the, the, the difference between digital and analog technologies. And so in this book he really separates digital and analog by saying that um, the difference between um, the analog world and the di digital world is that the first is composed by atoms and the second one is composed by bits. And the characteristic of these bits is that they can be transformed and broadcasted and transmitted in a, a, a various, through various mediums in various ways. And this kind of led to this idea of uh, ubiquitous computing and physical computing. And in this uh, article of Mark Weiser, The Computer for the 21st Century, um, the author says that the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. Uh, which is, I think, very interesting and it's what's happening today with uh, um, the maker movement and with uh, the incorporation of um, digital electronics and microcontrollers into um, everyday objects and artifacts or the Internet of Things and wearable technologies, all these fields. <coughs> And of course this has led to this uh, um, cultivation and uh, of this of course maker movement and all this appearance of fab labs, uh, maker spaces, hacker spaces and so on, uh, where um, big companies are supporting independent uh, makers, artists, thinkers, hobbyists, that want to incorporate uh, new technologies in their work. And I think this has somehow um, uh, got into sync with the craft revival that uh, is happening in the last 10 or 15 years, where um, people are starting to reevaluate uh, traditional handicrafts and reuse them in a more contemporary context. So um, we don't use handicrafts anymore as a way of uh, merely uh, decorative medium, but we can incorporate them into making actual products and making um, uh, artworks and uh, of course creating things that can be customizable and can serve ourselves or um, a, a greater community. And
And um, I also feel like um, this book from David Pai, The uh, Nature and Art of Workmanship, is very important as well because it kind of uh, distinguishes the um, the role that uh, the artisan or the craftsman had in the past and can be used in the future as well because he says that, in his book he says that uh, uh, the craftsman is kind of like a performer. So um, when you have a theatrical play or, um, or um, a, a movie, it doesn't really matter so much the content or the direction, it ends up uh, how good the, the project is going to be uh, on the quality of the performer, the actor, the one that is going to bring this project to life. And I think this applies also in the field of crafts. So um, it's really important to cultivate the techniques in order to be able to reach uh, fructiferous result and have something that is also tangible and interesting in order to move forward into the future. And of course this has led to the field of uh, electronic textiles and soft circuits, that th this hybrid form of uh, using digital technologies with traditional handicrafts and um, Although it started uh, as a part of uh, the MIT Media Lab, uh, I think right now uh, it has evolved and a lot of people are getting into this field, but it's still a very young field um, as I think about it, because there are a lot of projects that use these technologies, but I don't think that we have reached the full potential of it yet. So, um, the more people that get into it, the more interesting it's going to be. And I think that right now we have the power to kind of um, take things into our own hands and literally uh, weave uh, the future that we want to have. So, <clears throat> for me, one of the most interesting aspects of this field is uh, that it can be used to reflect on social conditions. And by this, I mean to kind of comment on things that are going on on a social level. And I would like to um, maybe um, get a bit deeper into that by um, showing a, a work that I did with uh, to other artists from Greece. Um, we did this project two years ago. It's called Economic Threads. And it's basically um, a project about unemployment in Greece. Uh, we basically hacked an old knitting machine and we created this algorithm that translates uh, the unemployment data from 2008 to 2013 um, in a series of patterns using traditional folk art motifs and then by uh, connecting the knitting machine to the computer we are able to, to knit in real time a kind of um, archive of the, of the unemployment and the crisis in Greece. And we don't want to do so in a, so, so, so much a political sense but we want to create, to do something creative with it. So it's not just data visualization for showing how the conditions are right now. It's more about um, creating like a kind of new cultural tradition with, the, um, with what's going on right now in Greece. And it was a very powerful piece for us and it took us quite some time to develop it because technically it was very challenging. And uh, the fact that in the last two years that we have presenting this project, we had the opportunity to present it in numerous occasions and in numerous festivals like uh, in Transmediale in Berlin, in Ars Electronica in Linz, uh, in, um, uh, um, the uh, International Symposium on Wearable Computers in Seattle and this year at the 
festival, uh, the video art festival of um, um, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, I think it's a very powerful statement for us and not only for us but also for the people that have supported this project because this project was done with the help of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens in the National Documentation Center uh, where they basically opened the, the databases for us and they remained open for quite some time so people could have access to this data and then for some political reasons they had to shut them down again so now these data are not accessible anymore. So um, it was a great opportunity for us to, to be able to work with this, uh, with this information. Uh, another project that I really think that uh, is in the same idea is the Knitted Radio by Ibru Kurbak and Irene Pos. Uh, these two artists are based in Vienna and they run a research project called uh, Stitching Worlds uh, on um, e-textiles and basically more in the research on how you can create knitted electronic components. So this project um, takes off from the idea of what happened uh, last year at the uh, um, manifestations and demonstrations at Getsi Park in Istanbul. And they created this um, sweater, knitted sweater, that actually works as a, as a radio transmitter with the idea that you can wear it and you can go out in the streets and you can transmit what you're saying so that through radio so that other people can uh, can hear you and you can kind of express publicly your opinion because of what happened and the, um, I don't know if you know the facts of what happened, but uh, during the, the demonstrations, the Turkish government had kind of um, limited all the, um, the, what people could actually post online. So, uh, Posts that had sp specific tags about Getty Park were being deleted automatically. And so this was a way for the artists to say that we can actually build something that is uh, invisible, it's subtle, and it's uh, incorporated in a, an everyday object, but can actually be used to expressing your opinion and uh, make yourself heard. And they did so by creating these uh, patterns on, uh, on uh, knitted fabric. And these patterns, apart from the aesthetic of it, they have a um, uh, functional um, aspect. So depending on the, on the pattern, uh, the, each pattern represents a different uh, capacitor value. So, uh, they created these patterns and then they published this in a women's knitting magazine so it could be disseminated and moved around without being uh, seen in, in a sense. <clears throat> Another artist that really works in this uh, social field is uh, Amor Muñoz. She's a Mexican artist and Right now she's also in Vienna uh, doing a residency there and she has been a winner of um, uh, uh, the Ars Electronica Interactive Art Award. Um, this project called Macula uh, Region 4, Region 4 is about basically um, empowering people that live in poor areas in Mexico. So the artist created this kind of mobile kiosk where she moved around from small town from one small town to another and she showed people how they could create uh, electronic textiles and she had uh, she did the crowds she did the crowdsourcing uh, for for her project and with the money that she got from the crowdsourcing she actually paid the people that participated in these interventions so um, she paid them with a the minimum uh, U.S. salary, which is um, 
a lot higher. I think it's like 10 times higher than the minimum wage in Mexico. And uh, each person did a, a textile circuit of, uh, um, for example, an alarm clock or some really basic everyday circuits. And then at, at the end of each circuit, at the bottom, as you can see in this image, she attached the QR code, which is also embroidered. And uh, by scanning the QR code, you can get information, as you see on the uh, bottom right image here, on who actually made the embroidery, how many hours it took them to complete it, how much money he earned, and afterwards these embroideries were exhibited in various exhibitions worldwide. So it was a great opportunity not only for the people that participated in the project to actually make money, but to introduce them to this kind of technologies that they can use in their everyday life. Uh, another project, a current project by Amor Munoz that she's working uh, on right now since last year, it's called the Yucatec. And it's basically a project that she runs in uh, the Yucatan area in Mexico. And uh, I don't know if you know the yucca plant. Uh, it's uh, basically a plant that you can make a, um, fibers of uh, like yarn. And uh, so she went to Yucatan and she worked with local artisans there. <laughs> and um, showed them how they can do electronic textiles and incorporated solar panels in these textiles so that they can actually have electricity and they can actually sell this energy. So it's also a way for them to make money and also a way for them to get in touch with new technologies. Another very interesting aspect for me of the textiles is the, this uh, tradition meets uh, craftsmanship. So it's what I said in the beginning that it's very important to kind of cultivate the techniques and share the knowledge in order to create more meaningful artifacts. And uh, I think a project that really expresses this idea is the crying dress uh, from uh, the artistic uh, duo Kobakant uh, from, from Hannah Perner Wilson and Mika Satomi. And Hannah is also an artist that she's from Salzburg and she was, uh, I think, giving a talk last year in Subnet. Uh, so the crying dress is um, a project about the potential future situation where um, electronics are so expensive that only very rich people can have access to them. So a very rich man uh, um, kind of commissions an artisan to create a dress for his wife to wear when he dies in order to, to mourn him at, hi at his funeral. So the crying dress is a mourning dress, a mourning gown that actually is composed by um, uh, a circuit that uh, reacts to uh, liquid and has incorporated embroidered speakers. And so the idea is when the, the woman that wears the dress cries, the, the dress will cry with her. Um, and also another project that Kobakant did uh, last year in uh, Istanbul, uh, it's called Inye Oyasi. And it's basically again uh, this idea that in a futuristic scenario where uh, the government has become so totalitarian that people cannot express themselves freely, which is not so like, far-fetched from reality and what happened last year at Getsy Park as well. Um, the, the local artisans use this uh, Turkish technique called needle lace, which uh, creates this kind of designs that you see in the image, in order to create kind of um, uh, lace symbols in the laces that could use could be used as a form of communication between individuals. 
So um, by incorporating uh, very small electronic components like uh, microchips and uh, some LEDs that uh, react uh, one, one to another, you can actually communicate with other people that are wearing something with needle lace. So it's a form of, again, subtle and invisible communication, but that also uses like the, the rich craft tradition of uh, Turkey uh, in order to create uh, a more kind of humane future, if you want. Um, another project that um, I did um, two years ago, and I'm still working on it, it's called Lilitronica. Uh, it's this uh, combination of traditional um, embroidery with uh, kind of uh, pop aesthetics and um, uh, this reference to pop music culture. And it's a series of embroidered synthesizers that are inspired by um, some really famous uh, electronic instruments like uh, uh, Microcorgs, uh, Korg's Microcorg or Roland's TR909 drum machine. So it's basically a series of synthesizers that are inspired by the original instruments but sound completely different. So it's a juxtaposition of uh, what the public really knows and understands, but seen through uh, a different perspective. And when I started to work on this project, I really thought that I was creating something more decorative, if you want. And uh, after uh, creating like the first and the second and the third synthesizer, I realized that there was some really um, interesting potential and also the sound that these instruments were creating. So I started to do a series of sound performances that um, really uh, made me uh, m more interested in the field of sound art. And uh, I think this project really plays well between this juxtaposition of what is known and what is unexpected. So most people, when they see it, they think, oh, this is something cute, sweet, uh, fragile. But then when you listen to the sound that these instruments can create, it really creates like a very contradictionary feeling because the, they can create a really loud and noisy soundscape. Uh, another interesting aspect of electronic textiles is the handcrafted feedback signals, as I, as I have called them. And um, so feedback signals for me is like um, creating feedback mechanisms that you can actually feel in your body and kind of make physical of something that is invisible or something that you take for granted. Um, one of these projects was uh, Isaidoru, uh, a project that I did um, some years ago uh, during the, um, a fellowship that I had at the CTM Festival in Berlin. And uh, it's uh, basically a wearable that uses uh, two accelerometers in the sleeves and translates the movement of the hands into sound. So it can create kind of this feedback mechanism between the movement of the body and the sound that produces and uh, the, the sound makes the body move and then the body creates the sound. So um, it really creates like a feedback loop between the person that wears it and the actual soundscape that it creates. Uh, this idea is also um, developed further in a project that I did last year during a residency uh, at uh, the Fab Lab in Barcelona uh, called Soft Articulations, where I created this uh, series of um, handmade uh, stretch sensors um, made of um, this uh, piezo-resistive material, Velostat, I don't know if you heard about it, 
and uh, conductive thread and, and neoprene. So it's also this idea of translating uh, muscle articulations into sound and getting feedback from how your body is moving. So this is a wearable bodysuit that has five different sensors in five different parts of the body. And uh, it's like a soft exoskeleton that kind of translates the movement again into sound and the sound uh, produces the movement as well as the movement, the sound. So it also creates this feedback mechanism between the performer and um, the soundscape. Um, another project uh, that I worked on last year uh, during a residency that I did in Linz uh, here in Austria uh, is called Divergence. And this is a project uh, that um, actually uses the, the human body as an electromagnetic field detector. So it incorporates two handmade uh, coils in the sleeves and uh, it has uh, two uh, vibration motors incorporating the chest of the garment. Uh, a mini jack audio connector and uh, um, a zipper that can be a zipper that is a volume control and at the same time a low pass filter. So um, depending on where you where you're at and how you're moving and if you're close to an electromagnetic source, it gives you vibrational feedback on your body and also sonic feedback that you can hear. And this is a, an open source project that is all published online. And my idea for this project was that to create a kind of uh, mechanism that anyone could replicate and create their own versions of it and could wear it to walk around in the city and kind of experience the, the, speci the speciality of the city and the invisible electromagnetic fields that are produced by devices all around us or by wireless networks and kind of get this physical um, sense of what's going on. Uh, also, this led me to a sound performance because as I said in the beginning, for me all this kind of led me into the field of sound art. And so I use it to um, create a, a a kind of noise soundscape from the devices that are connected like the mixer or the speakers or um, a, a TV that I use for example to visualize uh, the, the electromagnetic fields. So it actually creates again a feedback loop between the body, how the body is moving and how it's reacting to the sources that are around us. And the last project that I want to show you is called the Culture Series. It's a project that I developed with a Greek architect called uh, Daphne Papadopoulou. And we did this project this year, uh, last February, on a residency at uh, the Fab Lab of Milan we make. Um, it was a residency uh, curated by Zoe Romano, who is the responsible of wearables for the Arduino company. And uh, basically, this, um, um, this project is inspired in a um, uh, futuristic scenario uh, based on the books of Ian M. Banks, uh, uh, the British science fiction writer, uh, that in his books he actually talks about this um, uh, future civilization called the culture, where uh, people don't do a, a lot of things anymore. They just think, they just sit and think and uh, just uh, create like a life philosophy around them while they have machines that do everything for them. And in this culture, everything is sentient. So even the clothes they wear, even the devices that they use, they're all sentient. So they, they're all like living beings. 
And from this idea, we created a series of wearables, uh, an actual dress and, uh, and a blouse. Uh, by creating handmade um, uh, actuators, uh, moving actuators, using muscle wire, which is um, or, or shaped memory, memory alloy, which is basically a wire that can change its form when it's heated up. You can actually program it, program it in a form by uh, heating it up to a certain temperature, and then every time you heat it up, it returns to this shape. So um, we created these two wearables that react to the uh, heartbeat of the person that wears it. So depending on your heartbeat, the sleeves of the, of the two wearables move uh, accordingly to your heart rate. So it, it again creates like this visual and also physical because it's quite, you can actually feel it on your body when it's moving, of exteriorizing your interior in a sense and making, making it visible for others while making, making it something into something that others can perceive and you can perceive as well because we're all breathing and uh, we're all breathing and um, our, our heart is, is beating all the time but we are not like aware of it in a sense. And I want to finish by saying that it's really important to like disseminate these techniques and kind of share the knowledge. And I think that it's really important to uh, do, uh, to organize festivals and workshops and talks and kind of create a network of people that work around these techniques and actually get more people interested into this so we can actually create things that are meaningful for us because we consume technology at a very fast pace but we sometimes don't think about the consequences of this uh, consumption and we basically consume something and then we throw it away and then we buy another thing and most of the times we don't even think of how this thing was produced. And by uh, using these low-tech and high-tech techniques at the same time and materials, I think we can actually imagine a future that is going to be more friendly and more, more interesting. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>